So here's, here is what we've got. Let me, uh, just so you know, I've been a translator for, well, over 45 years now professionally. And I teach at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies. I teach translation, so on and so forth. None of this is very important to what we're talking about. Um, what, what I want to, what I'm going to give you a little background here. You may know some of this already, but just so everybody is sort of oriented. Um, opera wasn't invented until about 1590 or so. And in, for the first uh, several decades of its existence, it was a purely aristocratic medium. Only the aristocrats could afford to put it on. And then in 1537, an enterprising Venetian, uh, 1637, an enterprising Venetian got together and said, okay, okay, I'm getting a bad I'm feedback here. Uh, is anybody else unable to hear properly? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, so the, in 15, 1637, a Venetian got decided, okay, let's, let's make a theater and put on opera for the public and chart admission. And that made the thing feasible as a public entertainment. And within 13 years, by 1650, uh, Venice had, no, I'm not getting, there we go. Venice had uh, six opera houses. This is for a city of about 120,000 people, maybe the size of Visalia, California. And by 1700, there were nine or 10 opera houses. It was enormously important. And it was, uh, Venice became kind of the Broadway of opera at this point. Um, the opera season was incredibly short. It was only limited to Carnivale, and which ran from basically after Christmas until uh, the beginning of Lent. So we're talking maybe eight weeks for the whole opera season. And you've got six to 10 opera houses open, competing. Everybody wants to see new stuff. So opera, the operas would have very short runs and then everybody would say, okay, we've seen that, take it away, give us something new. And the operas would go into the archives, some, and. Many times they would just get completely lost, and that had nothing to do with quality. Uh, we have, uh, we know of, for example, Francesco Cavalli, who was um, the Stephen Sondheim of this Broadway, incredibly uh, popular and prolific. We of the operas that he wrote, that we know that he wrote, a third are lost, and a lot of others are only, known only to specialists. So it's not quest just a question of of quality. Many of these have been permanently lost, but a large chunk have wound up in the Biblioteca Marciana in Venice, right there on St. Mark's Square. Um, uh, now, the, and that's where Celine has been finding all of these goodies that we've been doing in the past few years. Um, now, we, the one I want to talk about, I don't know why, there we go. Um, the one I'd like to talk is about is La, is La Circe. It has the best examples that I can, the clearest examples for me to show you. Uh, this was done, we did this, what, three years ago now. Um, yeah. uh, so you, if you've seen that little talk I did on the Ars Minerva site, you know that we start with the libretto, with the printed libretto, and it's full of difficulties right there already. You may be able to see in this first line, it says, O magnanimo errore, meaning, O oh, great spirited mistake. Um, it's, a, it's a typo. It should be, O magnanimo eroe, great spirited hero. Um, so we have tons of situations like this where we have to decipher, Oh, they must have meant this instead instead of what it actually says. You can also see down in the, the, the two lines down at the bottom of this little text, at the end it's apre la strada and e con la spada, this S that looks like an F, right? And that ha also creates all kinds of interesting little problems. We had in our first production in, in uh, Cleopatra, the fellow who was singing Augustus said at one point, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute, where is this folio, this sheet of paper that I'm supposed to be talking about? And it turned out he wasn't talking about a sheet of paper at all. He was talking not about a folio, but about a soyo, his kingdom, his realm, his throne. <laughs> so we have all kinds of things where we just 
They have U's instead of V's and V's instead of U's. They're all kind of just dis deciphering what they're trying to say is already a little bit of a puzzle. And then you get to things where you just don't know what it is. This is uh, from the scene in Chiriche where the two uh, comic characters are getting drunk on her wine and they have this list of things they think it tastes like this, it tastes like that, it tastes like this, it tastes like that. And then they say, it seems like, it tastes like pelaku. Now, I talked to several colleagues who specialize in old Italian. They had no clue what a pelaku was. What I finally found after digging around a lot was a quote in Latin from some old 17th century dictionary. And basically what it's saying, which you can hardly read here, is that the people in Lombardy call pelacu a rose that has lost all of its petals and therefore something of no value, which once again is no help at all when it comes to wine. So we just had to punt and I think we said it was a Cretan white. Um, we don't get very many of those, but once in a while they still show up. An obvious question that may come up for a lot of you is why don't you just sing it in English? Do a singing translation because then everybody will understand it and you don't have to have titles and all that stuff. I want to talk a little bit about why for me I don't think that works at all. First of all, singing translations are incredibly difficult to do. You need the exact number of syllables That's because that's all the notes you're going to get. You have to keep the syllabic stresses, which is terribly difficult when you're moving from one language to another. And yet you've got to keep the emotional and plot content and the thematic content if you can manage it. And you can't have any hard syllables on high notes. It's very difficult to sing the E sound if somebody is way up at the top of their range. And so you've got to change, you've got to make sure everybody, if you go up there, all of your vowels are things like as and ahs and whatever. So they don't have to, so, because otherwise they're not going to be able to sing it at all. Let me give you an example, though, of something that goes even farther with that. You're probably a little familiar with La Boheme, the opera, but just in case, it's a uh, in the first act. Um, you've got a, there's a starving poet named Rodolfo who's living in a garret in Paris, and there's a knock on his door, and he opens it, and there's this lovely young woman from downstairs named Mimi who needs her candle to be relit because it's gone out. And there's a lot of byplay, but in the course of things, she drops her key. Both of their candles go out and they wind up gra grasping around, groping around on the floor together to try to find the key. And not by mistake, his hand touches hers. And he exclaims, he says, Que gelida manina, se la lasci riscaldar. This is an, ex now notice this is an exclamation. The first thing he says is, my goodness, your hand is cold. And that is, now it's not just, um, it's not just, my goodness, your hand is cold. It's not just any old hand. It's not una mano, it's una manina. It's a sweet little hand. And it's not just cold, it's not just fredda. It's gelida, the word has gelo, ice in it. Her hand is icy cold, it's scary cold. He's really startled at how cold her hand is. Then he says, se la lasci riscaldar. Now, he's been totally smitten with Mimi the minute she walked into the door, okay? But Rodolfo has class. And so he's still using the most polite form of address that's available in modern Italian, which is the third person singular, the lay form. And he says, saying that, he says, allow me to help you warm up your hand in the most polite way possible. Now, as things go along, he's going to get friendlier and call her voi. And by the end of the scene, they're going to be in love and they'll be calling each other tu, which is the intimate form of address. But he starts out being very, very gentlemanly, extremely gentlemanly. Okay. So you have something on the order of your little hand is so cold. Please permit me to, to help you warm it. Now, in the 1950s, the Met in New York did a, a production with Richard Tucker and Anna Moffo in English because they thought maybe it would work. And I'm not going to play it for you because we, we don't want to go into endless time. But the translation that they used was, I'll hold your hand in my hand and soon it will be warm. Now, 
the meaning, there's several layers of meaning that get lost here. First of all, there's no exclamation. He doesn't even notice how cold her hand is, which is a plot point because she's got consumption. Of course her hand is cold. But so it, he just, and there's no, no, please allow me. He, he just goes right in for the kill and says, I'm gonna hold your hand. <laughs> Assuming, just taking for granted that she's gonna like that. And then he says, and it's gonna be warm. And I don't know, but to me that has sort of a ha ha ho he kind of quality about it that uh, they're gonna warm things up pretty good soon. It's a completely different feeling to the whole beginning of their scene together, or at least the beginning of the aria and the way he really begins to introduce himself to her. So he's become a completely different character, at least in the words. So there's this real, really serious, this is not just, this isn't quite what the words say. It's not what the words say at all, but they have to do this somehow in order to make the syllables fit. Que jelly da manina, I'll hold your hand in my hand, okay? The syllables fit, so that's what they're singing. There's also the problem of the stress time versus syllable time language, and I, that we could go, way down a rabbit hole in this and I won't. Italian, English is what we call a stress timed language, which means, you know, think of to be or not to be, that is the question. The stresses, the stressed syllables are longer than the unstressed syllables. So we have ba-dum, 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 bam, ba-da-bam. Ba -ba to be or not to be, that is the question, okay? Italian is what's called a syllable timed language where all the syllables run at pretty much the same speed and emphasis comes in with pitch and volume and things. So you have lasciate una speranza voi che entrate, which is a line from, from Dante's Divine Comedy. Lasciate una speranza, speranza voi che entrate. Ba -da -ba 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 so when the composer, compo who's an Italian composer, composes something, he's going, of course, to compose it as syllable time. And changing it to English, English is stress timed, and so you're alienating something extra. Now, you can, there's something called the normalized pairwise variability index, and they've actually tried to quantify how stress timed versus how syllable timed the language is by measuring the length of the vowels and syllables. If you're interested in this, contact me. I'll get, here's the quote. I don't understand it. I'm not going to try to explain it to you. If you find it interesting, by all means, I'll let you know how to find it. So you get the singing translation, you get the loss of meaning, but you also have, oh, sorry, I bent back. You also get a loss of sound. We don't say in English, naturally, I'll hold your hand in my hand. We say, I'll hold your hand in my hand. It doesn't go, ba 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 bum It goes, ba 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 bum ba ba bum And soon it will be warm. No, that's not how we say, would say it. We say, we'll say, and soon it will be warm. ba dum ba 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 bum so you've got this Procrustean bed that we're trying to jam this stress-timed language into a syllable-timed, into syllable-timed music. So there's a loss there all around. You lose a bunch of different things in singing translations. If, if you're even approximately on the meaning, you're already profiting when you're in a, a sing, singing translation. So on top of the, so there are all these difficult things, that they, the same number of stresses, keep the syllables, all these things, it's terribly difficult. You lose, you lose meaning, you lose sound, and then people won't understand anyway because it's too hard for the singers to really articulate all this stuff, especially if it's not really the right stuff. It's not the way it was written for the music anyway. So you lose so much in the singing translation that I myself have, for years, ever since they were introduced back around 1980 as an opera goer, I've always preferred titles. And so with titles, titles have their own limitations, for sure. You have a maximum of very roughly 72 characters per title, a uh, maximum of two lines, so it means about 36 characters per line. Uh, sentences can't usually spread between titles, although sometimes you've got to. But the thing is, it's got to communicate instantly because people don't want to be sitting there reading your stupid title when there's a performance going on. You want them to be able to get what's going on and go right back to looking at the performance. You also got to anchor the plot points and you've got to bring along the emotional weight or there's no point. If you haven't brought in the plot and the emotional weight, there's, you haven't told people really what's going on. 
So here's an example of some of the issues that we got into with trying to create titles for Circe. This is the moment when Andromaca introduces herself and her two companions to Circe. Um, and if the literal translation is, to you, Circe, bows of Hypsipyle and of heroes obsequious the foot. Um, she is masquerading under the name of Hypsipyle, her husband's sister, for reasons that have to do with operatic plot, which you know means that doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense, but there we are. So let's turn this a little more into something. What she's saying is, Circe, Hypsipyle is my name, and I bring you two heroes. This business of bowing your foot, they can bow on the stage. Everybody knows that they're bowing already. You don't have to say that you're bowing. Here's another thing from early in the opera. Circe hears that Ulysses has left and she's furious and she wants to call down curses on him. She does, whether above from the ether or below among the bitter waves, shoot to strike him down like lightning, open to swallow him up, the sphere, the arrows, the dark abysses, the sea. Um, this uses some rhetorical devices that are really unfamiliar to people. Um, this is, uh, what is it called? Let me, I made a note, because I, I keep it, synthesis is what it's called, where you split things up that, that actually belong together. So here, if we start taking it, this apart and putting it back into the piece of the way it's supposed to go, it's skies, shoot your arrows from the ether above to strike him down like lightning, or C, open your dark abysses to swallow him up among the bitter waves below. I don't care which. You got, this is, that's also not gonna be usable, right? So we have to say, let the lightning strike him down, let the sea swallow him up, because she's going lickety split. She's going a mile a minute. There's no way that all those words are gonna fit in to the time that we've got to communicate this. So I'm gonna, let's see if I can go back. Skies shoot your arrows from the ether above to strike him down like lightning, or C, open your dark abysses to swallow him up among the bitter waves below. There is no time for all those words. All you've got the time for is, let the lightning strike him down, let the sea swallow him up. Here's another example. This is poor Andromaca again. She's gotten herself into a real plight here because she has masqueraded as her husband's sister. And then since, Circe thinks that, uh, that he, her husband is free, she goes ahead and makes a big play for him, which makes Andromaca extremely unhappy. But in here, besides all the other confusions, we have this allusion to Juno. Now, nobody nowadays is going to be aware that Juno was the wife and the sister of Jove. So that's a piece of information that the modern audience, for the most part, is just not going to have. And on, the top, on top of that, then you've got all this complication. I am not Juno, and through my cruel fate of my be beautiful beloved, I have made myself the sister when I am his wife. Oh, a cursed deception which fills me with dismay, alas, because of jealousy, even though I am not Juno, I am she. Which it, you have to sit, if you, even if you have it right in front of you, deciphering that is real work. So, you have to break it down. Juno could be both sister and wife to Jove. This has to be information that the audience, in order for them to understand what's going on at all, they have to have this information. I am no Juno, yet now cruel fate has made me my husband's sister. Terrible falsehood. I am not Juno, yet now my lie has left me as jealous as she. You see how we take the underlying substance of what's being said. I'll back up again. The underlying substance of this and puts it into, you have to chop it up into bits that can be absorbed quickly and that carry the emotional meaning at the same time. So I am not Juno and through my cruel fate of my beautiful, so once again, I, Juno could be both sister and wife to Jove. I am no Juno, yet now cruel fate has made me my husband's sister terrible falsehood. I am not Juno, yet now my lie has left me as jealous as she. 
So we carry as much information as we can into the titles, but sometimes it's got to be reorganized just in order to make it make sense. Here's another example. This is from Glauco. If if you happen to if see you happen to see the production, you re you'll remember you'll that. Remember. I don't know. I'm getting ridiculous feedback again. I don't know why. Um, you'll remember that this was a, this guy had the hots for a nymph named Sheila, and um, he's trying to seduce her in this scene. So he says, "Oh, eyes more precious than any treasure." It's lovely rays only in you, on me, let my son turn, thus happy among the flames I will be a new phoenix. So besides all this elaborately complicated stuff, you've also got this thing of the phoenix, which for most people nowadays is going to be a city in Arizona. People aren't going to be aware that the phoenix was a mythical bird that every 500 years would build its own funeral pyre and then burst into flames and be reborn which is what he's really trying to say. I, oh, eyes more, he's trying to address her, but he talks to eyes and it's, for us, it's very strange. So unscrambling this a little bit, oh, eyes more precious than, precious than any treasure, let my son, meaning the girl, turn its lovely rays upon me only through you, meaning the eyes, thus I will be a new phoenix happy among the flames. Still, this is way too complicated and may, way too many words to squeeze into a title within the time that's gonna be available. And so we go for something, oh, heavenly eyes better than any treasure, look at me, set me on fire, and I'll die happy and be reborn in the flames. So you see how it, it's not merely a question of taking the meaning of the thing, of, of getting the words, but also, you have to dig underneath the words and get what the, the, the character is after and then try to phrase that in a way that's going to stick as closely as possible to the original, but communicate very quickly. Now he's talking to eyes again, but this time, this is after poor Sheila has been turned into a monster. And he now he's talking, he's saying, apostrophizing his eyes and saying, hateful eyes. So here we have hateful pupils, you who of a monster into the horrible appearance, transformed see the beautiful one I adore, on the dead hopes in my living suffering, alas, melt in tears. Now this is supposed to be very sad, but it, you, there's no way that you're gonna get through all this verbiage to really understand it, especially in a short time. So have, once again, you have to scramble it around to get it into some kind of form, first that's just comprehensible in its own terms. Hateful eyes, you who see the beautiful one I adore transformed into the horrible appearance of a monster, alas, melt in tears for the dead hopes in my living suffering. Still, there are still way too many words for what has to happen. So again, you go pare it down some more, go under the surface and bring things forward. Now I hate my eyes. They've seen my beautiful darling transformed into something vile. Let them dissolve in tears from my dead hopes and my living pain. Here's the last one. This again is Glauco. Um, there's a moment you may remember if you saw the show where he's tried to get Cersei to persuade Sheila to like him. And he's overhearing the conversation. He's eavesdropping. And at first he thinks it's all going really well. And then he suddenly realizes that Cersei is doing just the opposite. And she's working very hard to turn Sheila against him and make sure that she Sheila will have never never have anything to do with him, and suddenly he this is a, a moment of comic reversal, and so what he says in the Italian is Oh heavens, Oh God, what am I hearing, which is about as funny as just dropping your shoe. Um, so we have to you, if you if you saw the production, you may remember that he was sort of this um, gigolo type. Wearing, uh, wearing a kind of an Elvisy Las Vegas costume, a young guy. And so, so to get some, the, the real joke of the matter, Celine and I got together and we just decided what he really should be saying, especially for a character like that is, 
not oh god oh heavens oh god what am i hearing but dude what which got the laugh and that was the point <laughs> um so anyway there's an idea of of the process of, of some of the steps that have to go along go on in order to get the um to get to, to turn these elaborately complicated italian texts into titles that can be quickly absorbed and still carry as much as possible of the meaning that we wanted let me now see if i can turn this business back i'm not going to i'm going to stop my share and i'm going to try to turn things hand things back to celine yeah am i back so celine is now the host oh, okay <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Joe. Really big applause. This was uh, incredible. You do such an amazing work and uh, it's, and uh, I, I want to tell everyone that Joe sits with us during rehearsal, every rehearsal, and he listens to everything and he refines uh, the translation into the titles uh, day after day. It's very intense because when we rehearse, then we rehearse eight hours a day. Uh, so he's with us eight hours a day and then he has to put all these together. Uh, so he, it's really um, very, very, very intense for everyone and also for Joe. And then when we are in the theater, he's in charge of uh, running the titles. So really, thank you so much, Joe. We are very fortunate to have you with us. <laughs> uh, it's fun. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, this was really great. And if you have also ideas um, of uh, topic that we can talk about, uh, please let me know. Uh, send me an email at info at arsminerva.org or even to me, Celine Ricci at arsminerva.org. And uh, I'll certainly be very happy to actually build small uh, online events, uh, small lectures, uh, that topic that you are interested about what we do because it's so unique that I understand that you have uh, specific questions and even more questions about the uh, translations. Um, so thank you so much. Um, well, also, Celine, by the way, yeah. uh, while I was being the host, it flashed to me that we have unlimited minutes, so we can go on longer if people want to. All right. Uh, yes, I, so I have some, uh, um, here's some comments that uh, say that really uh, you do an amazing uh, uh, job, uh, um, Joe. And, oh, uh, I can see the chat. I don't need, don't, don't tell me. <laughs> Thank you all. Well, uh, <laughs> we don't well, have to go so, through, we don't have to waste time on that. I can see it. Thank well, you. <laughs> so, so what, so if I, I have, a, if we can go a little bit further, I have a question. It's like, what do you, um, when you sit with us all day long during rehearsal, uh, then how, how do you then, when you, then you work by yourself at night, uh, how do you, um, I mean, it must be really uh, very uh, difficult to do all this while you listen to us and then uh, mix everything. Well, I've, you know, I have a, a very, very raw set of, titles when we come into rehearsal and as we go along i'm constantly working there right on the titles themselves uh making new ones rewriting what we've got uh when we see you know oh wait a minute there's a fabulous joke there i'd rewrite it so make sure that we have the joke in um or you know there's some there's going to be much more time than i expected so i can build in a little bit more or as you know we've had situations where we realized that a chunk of text was actually missing from the score and we had to put it back in so i'm also kind of sitting there as a watchdog to say wait a minute we've got this if you say this here that doesn't make any sense it's we've got to read it this way or else we have we, we've got to the character is being self-contradictory. So I'm doing a lot of little odds and ends there, but I'm basically rewriting the titles as we go along. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's really very, very, very impressive. And then when you are in the booth for the super titles, how I know that you have lots of click. Can you explain us more about that? Well, it's just a PowerPoint presentation, just like you saw, except that they're very simple slides. That, that are just, uh, I won't try to bring one up now, but they're just a black background with the words on it in a, the place where they can best be seen on the projector, 
from the projector. And, and there are, as I said in the little thing that we did before, there are between six and 800 roughly slides for every show. So I just, I have my score and I'm watching what's going on as the, as the performance goes on. And I click each time the title has to change. It's something that you can never automate because you never know uh, how exactly how long a given moment is going to take in the score, or if somebody takes a little extra piece of business before the laugh comes, you don't want to anticipate the laugh by by punching the title too soon. Or th there are a million different ways in which things change just from one performance to another. So I've got to be sitting there watching things, and it can be it can be very tricky because especially when somebody like Celine gets the bit between her teeth and is doing an extremely uh, or, ornate version of the second round of an aria, um, it doesn't look anything like what's in the score. And I have to be sitting there rigorously counting the beats, the measures, to make sure that I can, I, because sooner or later she's going to shift, but I don't know when anymore because it's, it's, the, the music isn't what's written there at all anymore. Uh, so it, 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 it stays lively anyway. <laughs> And uh, there is also a question, how many hours from the first draft to the super titles? How many hours of work? Oh, my. <laughs> <laughs> I don't count. I, I truly don't count because if I did, I'd get a little scared because no arts organization could ever pay for that many hours. So I don't want no, to not think of it in those terms. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Joe, and thank uh, again everyone for joining us today. And um, we'll continue having those events uh, and waiting for all of us to be able to meet for real. Um, and again, please um, let me know if there are any topics uh, we can uh, discuss. Uh, and yeah, let's have more of these uh, casual family style meetings and uh, I wish you a great weekend and please be safe and be well and hope to see you very, very soon. Thanks everybody bye, for bye. showing up. Bye. bye.